Welcome back. I'm That Chemist. Today we're going to talk about drying solvents and some of the ways that you dry solvents are going to be a little bit controversial. So you better stick around till the end so that you get to hear how we dry acetone properly. So without further ado, let's get started. So there's several different considerations when you want to dry solvents. Sometimes you want to purify solvents from impurities other than water, such as oxygen, nitrogen. Now the main way you degas a solvent is using what's called freeze pump thaw. But the main purpose of this video is to discuss the removal of water from solvents. So some of the techniques that we're going to discuss are superior. However, it'll be controversial because there's ways people typically dry things. Usually, almost entirely, 3A emulsives will do the best job, but there are a few exceptions. Now, the other thing to consider is that the level of dryness that you actually need is context specific. So you don't need to have analytically dry solvent all the time. So the main three references that I'm going to use in this are shown here, these three articles. And if you ever want to dry a solvent that doesn't have any drying conditions listed in these three articles, it's worth checking out the purification of laboratory chemicals. This will give you methods to dry your solvents. However, it doesn't quantify their dryness. The main thing to consider with this set of papers is that the best way to determine dryness is to use Carl Fischer titration, which is an electrochemical potential mediated titration. And so the main way that we dry solvents is using molecular sieves. So both 3A and 4A molecular sieves will dry solvent, but in general, 3A molecular sieves will be better and faster, and that's because it's like perfectly shaped, perfectly sized to fit water. Now the way that they work is they adsorb water into the pores. So water can slip in there and then it just kind of gets stuck basically. So it's nice and happy being in there. However, you can get rid of the water afterwards by regenerating it. Now, 4A molecular sieves will work as well, but you can also remove different small molecules. So methanol, for instance, can fit inside of the cavity of a 4A mole sieve. Additionally, there's 5A molecular sieves, uh, but these are usually used just in industry, and we don't tend to use them in research too, too much, at least in terms of organic synthesis. So if you want to activate mole sieves, the way that you do this is by heating them. The method of preference for me is to just heat them up in a glassware oven for at least one night, maybe two nights. Now, there's different specifications depending on the vendor, and if you heat them with a blowtorch, this can be too hot and this can cause them to cavitate. So this can cause your emulsives to lose some of their activity. Now, if you're a researcher and you just want to blowtorch them for like 10 seconds under vacuum, that might be faster and it might not matter that you lose some activity. But if you care about the integrity of your catalyst, it's important to treat them properly. And so most of the time, the activation temperature is between 175 and 350 degrees Celsius. This is just based off of the specifications that Aldrich gives for all of their different emulsives. However, for each specific case, for each specific product number, you can look at what temperature is recommended. Now, I have a story here. So you can dry emulsives uh, in the glassware oven, which is what I was saying earlier. So in my lab, we had a glassware oven, and quite often people would put their emulsives in a beaker in there, but then someone would knock over the beaker and it would spill all the emulsives down into the element of the oven. And so what would happen is the emulsives would cause the element to short out and the oven would break. And so this happened like at least six times during my PhD, maybe more. And every time it happened, the researchers in the lab were like, are you serious? Like, how does this keep happening? Okay. So I gave a modified version of this presentation to my group a couple years ago. And when I brought this up in group meeting that, just so you know, like you could be doing this in the oven. Uh, however, you might want to do it under vacuum, blah, blah, blah. It was brought to the attention of the lab members that that glassware oven actually didn't even get above 100 degrees Celsius. And so that oven was just breaking over and over, even though it wasn't activating the emulsives, which is kind of hilarious. So maybe you don't put them in the oven if you think you're going to spill stuff. Or if you are going to put them in the oven, use a secondary container so that you don't break your oven. Uh, an additional way that you can dry emulsives is by using a microwave. This could be a lab microwave or just like a, you know, a repurposed food microwave. And then you just microwave it for a few minutes at a time, shake it up, and then you just have to do that several times. But you just have to be careful not to burn yourself, and so you should use heat-resistant tongs. Now, if you have brand new emulsives, you might think that they're brand new, so you don't need to activate them. But more often than not, you do need to still activate them. Additionally, if you want to reuse them, so let's say that you have some emulsives for DCM, acetonitrile, etc., what you can do is you can just finish off using that solvent, let your bottle vent in the back of your hood, and then once they're bone dry, you can reactivate them in the oven. Now, for certain solvents where impurities are formed upon treatment with emulsives, you might want to use fresh ones. And if cost isn't an issue, you can just use fresh ones anyway. Okay, so the first solvent is THF. Now, THF is most commonly dried with stills. So most labs that I've been in have either had a solvent drying system 
which has special columns used to dry the solvents. Um, however, I've also been in labs with stills. So the way a still works is usually you have sodium benzophenone and it's refluxed and then you distill off whatever THF you need. And so the issue here is you can see that sodium and benzophenone will actually only get the water content down to 43.4 ppm, whereas 3A molecular sieves at 20% mass per volume loading after waiting for 20 or after waiting for 72 hours will actually get the water content down to much lower. And so this is controversial because you might think, well, sodium's so reactive, it's going to get rid of every last bit of water. But as you'll see through many of these tables, just because you have a very reactive reagent doesn't mean every last little bit of water is going to get reacted. In the case of 3 emulsives, it, there's a driving force in terms of having vacancies that the water by probability will go into and get stuck. So usually 3 emulsives are the best. Now, if you don't need rigorously dry emulsives, you can get away with less and you can get away with uh, like slower or less long drying times. So you can do shorter drying and that's fine. Now, uh, again, depending on application, you might want to use Illumina, however, emulsives would be my method of choice. Okay, so this is just re-highlighting the sodium benzophenone is worse, but oftentimes you also want to bring this stuff into a glove box, so you want to get rid of oxygen as well. That would be one advantage of stills. If you're really worried, you could just do a still, you know, get rid of all of the oxygen and most of the water, then throw it over 3 emulsives, and that should be fine. Okay, toluene. So toluene, surprise, surprise, 3 emulsives works the best. Uh, silica is pretty close, but if you want to purify it with silica, you just would have to pass the solvent through a column of silica. And in this case, they uh, they didn't try and run it through till they started seeing water come off the silica. So methylene chloride, DCM, once again, 3 emulsives is the method of choice. However, the silica method can work quite well also. Additionally, if we look at acetonitrile, you can see 3 emulsives is the method of choice, not super surprising. Okay, but you can see that uh, you can also use Illumina and that works pretty well too. In the next example, we have methanol. And so methanol is one of the hardest solvents to dry. Not quite the hardest, but it's pretty, pretty stubborn. So you can use 3 emulsives. Like I was mentioning earlier, you don't want to use 4 emulsives for methanol because methanol can actually fit into the 4 emulsives. So it's not going to do as good of a job drying it. Now, if we look here, you can see that with 20% mass per volume loading of 3 emulsives, even after 120 hours, it's still only down to 10.5 ppm. So it's quite stubborn comparatively, and it's quite slow to get it down to really, really low levels of water. You can see that the other methods here using KOH and magnesium and iodine also work, but not quite as well. If we look at ethanol, it's similar to methanol, although uh, we can get to a slightly lower water content with 20% mass per volume loading. Uh, KOH also works quite well here. You can see 26 ppm is pretty decent, considering that all you have to do is use KOH and do a distillation from that. Um, so that's pretty decent, especially given how wet the solvent started out. Now, HMPA, it's a very, very polar solvent, very hard to dry. You can see here that if you use P2O5, potassium, uh, sorry, phosphorus pentoxide, you can get it down to 22 ppm, although it's necessary to do a distillation. Similarly, you can use uh, four emulsives. Uh, however, if you're going to do this, they did sequential drying. And so what sequential drying is, is they basically leave the four emulsives in the HMPA. They then decant off the HMPA and they use fresh emulsives. And so you might think you could just add more and more emulsives, but this is the best way to get this totally completely dry. Okay, so you can see they have tried other methods and this still has, you know, thousands of PPM water content in most cases. So it's quite hard to get it dry. Now DMF is similar. So you can see three emulsives are the method of choice. However, they had to do sequential drying as well to get it down to 1.5 ppm. But this is actually pretty dry. Um, you can see that it takes quite a long time, though, if you're not going to be doing that sequential drying. If we look at DMSO, it's basically the same thing, except in this case, we actually want to use four emulsives. And again, it's necessarily it's necessary to do sequential drying. Uh, acetone here, you can see that boric anhydride is actually the method of choice. It's kind of interesting because I don't think I've even encountered boric anhydride ever in organic chemistry whatsoever other than in this context. And so what they do here is they dry it over boric anhydride and then they do a distillation. If they don't do a distillation, they actually get decomposition into a little bit of the, um, the mesidyl oxide. So here you can also see for the molecular sieves, the molecular sieves form 2% mesidyl oxide. And that's because a number of these reagents cause the acetone to undergo a self-aldol condensation, eliminating water as a product and forming mesidyl oxide. So mesidyl oxide, it's not too great. Now the worst case here is the barium oxide where you can see 12% mesidyl oxide formed. Whereas for the B2O3, 
there actually doesn't appear to be any significant um, micellar oxide forming, just in the case of molecular sieves. So I have used 3A and 4A mole sieves for drying acetone. I've never seen a significant amount of micellar oxide by NMR, specifically for uh, acetone D6. I guess if it's deuterated, you wouldn't necessarily see it. Um, although if you really want to have pure acetone, you want to avoid having any impurities. So you could use B2O3 in that case. Benzene, again, molecular sieves is the method of choice. You can see that some of the other methods, such as calcium hydride, actually do a pretty decent job for benzene, uh, although the molecular sieves still are better. 1,4-dioxane, there's a number of different methods that are similar in terms of how dry they get. Here you can see KOH is pretty good, but sodium is the method of choice. Molecular sieves actually do a worse case, a worse job in the case of 1,4-dioxane. So hopefully this has been an interesting lecture talking about the drying of different solvents. Uh, I hope that you've taken these to heart and you'll teach your lab mates about which solvent is best to use. It would really help out this channel if you left a like and subscribed, and I hope you have a great day.